So now our work is finished. The DVD is in your player, and I'm going to teach you how to never get raided. We're going to fly in a helicopter and teach you how to grow marijuana outdoors without getting busted. We're going to talk about growing marijuana indoors. We're going to talk about spotting informants and undercovers. I'm even going to teach you how to sell marijuana safely. And finally, Candy and I have a very important message to parents. So grab some popcorn, your favorite drink, and let's get started. Okay, we're gonna get started. This is the section of the DVD that teaches you how to grow marijuana without it being spotted. Remember, when you're growing marijuana outdoors, put duct tape on the bottom of your feet really well to cover up your footprints. A footprint can get you convicted. Now, we don't have ours in duct tape because we're not the growers. I've noticed some fairly fresh tracks, so it's got me a little concerned. However, while we were creeping a little earlier, I spotted two deer up ahead, which is good news to us. That means up ahead, there's not any other humans. So keep that in mind. Let the wildlife tell you what's going on in the woods. Uh, just like you saw in Tarzan, if you see birds fluttering from trees, something's scaring those birds. So anytime wildlife is jumping around, if you see a squirrel in the distance in a tree, it's a safe bet that the DEA is not lying in wait for you. Okay. I'm not positive about this, but this might look like a fence cut for a grower to get in and out. We've already been up in the air. I know there are marijuana plants sparsely scattered in this area. We just have to find them without DEA spotting us or grower spotting us. This is not good to do. Keep this stuff away from your grow area. If you have to use it, pack it back out with you. The growers did a great job hiding and disguising this. They put it in a black bag, a seven dust to get bugs off of their plants. Root activator. They were thirsty, orange juice. Insecticide, of course, off because of mosquitoes. And that's about all that's interesting. <laughs> I really believed I would find one of my never get busted videos in here, but I didn't, so. <laughs> the DEA looks for dead trees and PVC pipes and trash. They also look for things growing in unnatural patterns. Nothing in the wild grows in rows or in a triangle pattern or in a snail pattern like some growers do. Don't grow your pot in rows. Don't do the old snail pattern trick. It's much safer to plant four or five plants in one area. Go 50 yards, plant four or five more plants where it looks natural. Remember, the more natural you can keep everything, the safer you're going to be. Take a look at this tree that's been cut. Outdoor marijuana growers will cut trees down in the winter or they'll take a hatchet with poison in the head and make deep cuts into a living tree and that poison climbs up and kills the tree and all the leaves. Now these growers chose to cut this tree out of the way and the reason they needed to is for sunlight to get into the marijuana plant. This is a field we're approaching that the DEA already eradicated. What I'm hoping for 
they'll usually leave a few plants behind and uh, they'll set up cameras, little trip cameras. Because a lot of times the growers, even if they know their field has been eradicated, they're curious and they'll go back and see what in the world was destroyed. Never go back, you hear me? Never go back. The DEA came in with bulldozers. There's no telling how many plants they eradicated out of here, but they left some. I see it from here, come on. Isn't it wonderful that there is no way the DEA or any other law enforcement agency can totally eradicate such a beautiful, healthy plant? This plant helps millions of people. Less than 10 yards from those four or five marijuana plants is a well-worn path right down to a large creek. The DEA flies creeks and ponds because they know growers have to plant close to water sources like this grower did. So remember that. If you can grow your plants away from water sources and you tote the water in, you're a lot safer. Airplane, airplane. Stay down and be still, just be still. That's okay if it's connected with anything. By the time they get ground units here, we're gone. When we took cover, look what we landed in. A male marijuana plant. The growers forgot to pull that guy. There's another chopper I just saw go through here, but it, it was way off. If, if you're ever outdoors gorilla growing like these people are, you make positive. Any aircraft that flies over, the most important thing is to be still and duck your head. Don't look up at it like this because your face shines. Dixie cups, do not leave these laying around. That's what the growers started their plants with. I saw these from the air. Notice how the grower has them sparsely scattered and he's not planting them in rows? That's a good idea. This is a little female plant here, already budding out. Uh, they've got one tucked away here in the brush. It's already budding out. Uh, and I'm sure there will be more. I know for sure it's the growers cutting this fence now because right there is a water can. Keep your water cans hidden. Now this grower was smart because it's green or camouflage. This would be really, really hard to spot from the air. Look at this. That looks like a stick to you. Pull it out and it's their file. This is what they use to keep their tools sharp, to harvest their plants, to hoe, that kind of thing. And they kind of disguised it, which was kind of neat. When it comes to marijuana, Barry Cooper is on the wrong side of the law. The war on drugs is a failed policy. It's not working. Cooper not only believes marijuana should be legal, he's trying to help people grow it and not get caught. Marijuana is the number one cash crop in the United States going into the billions of dollars right above corn. Cooper says the bumper crop of marijuana found this summer in North Texas proves how popular pot has become. Americans are not going to stop growing it. They're not going to stop buying it. They're not going to stop smoking it, even if you continue to put them in jail. Last month, local and federal drug agents descended on seven fields in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and destroyed more than 25,000 marijuana plants. It's impossible to eradicate. And I know that because I'm an ex-narcotics officer. In fact, just a short walk away, Barry Cooper found what he was looking for. Here's a female marijuana plant, and that's what everybody is after, what's causing the billion dollar fuss. There's no doubt in my mind there are thousands of other fields like this. I think they got seven of these fields. There are thousands more. And they're about to start budding right now, by the way, too. So about October's harvest time.
this section is going to teach you how to grow marijuana indoors without getting busted. But I'm speaking mainly to the hundreds of thousands of closet growers that want to grow 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 plants in their house safely. You know, some people say it's safer to grow their marijuana at home than having to hit the street and meet a drug dealer in a parking lot somewhere. Unfortunately, every year police seize millions of dollars worth of cash and property from marijuana growers. Police are more interested in taking your property and your money than placing you in jail. It's turned into a huge industry for law enforcement. There are three enemies of grow rooms. Heat, people, and sloppiness. Heat is your enemy because marijuana takes lights to grow indoors and lights generate excessive heat. People are your enemy because they're the traffickers of information and if they get mad at you or if they're paid to do so, they will inform. And finally, sloppiness is your enemy. Unfortunately, growers get busted every year because they didn't have the information they needed to control the evidence. FLIR, forward-looking infrared radar, which is a heat imaging camera, is one of my favorite topics because it's so surrounded in mystery and rumor. I'm going to explain to you exactly what a FLIR can see and what a FLIR can't see, and then I'm going to teach you how to beat that FLIR camera to make sure you never get raided. Forward-looking infrared radar, or FLIR, or FLIR, can be mounted to helicopters, or they can even be handheld like a video camera. They cannot see through anything, so these cameras do not have the ability to see into your house and look at your plants. Forward-looking infrared radar simply is an imaging camera that takes pictures of heat. A really easy way for you to understand this is you've seen a, a hot coals before and you held your hand above the hot coals and you felt the heat. Well, those are infrared rays that you're feeling. They're invisible, but you can feel them. FLIR allows you to see those heat rays. FLIR cameras are used a lot in law enforcement in discovering indoor grow operations. They'll either fly over your house or creep up to your house with a handheld FLIR camera hoping to detect excessive heat in your home. What you're seeing now is footage taken through a handheld FLIR camera. Notice the people walking. White is the most heat. Black is little or no heat. The reason people's faces show up white and bright is because we know the majority of the heat coming from a human escapes through their head. Notice the cars driving, how hot they are underneath. That's the exhaust. See how hot this car is underneath here because it's been driving down the highway? Notice how the fender wells are full of heat? That's from the friction caused by braking. So I want you to just study the heat patterns in this scene. We included trees and cars and people and lights. And this is taken in total darkness. Notice the windows are very black because windows are cold. Touch your window, they're cold. Crawl under a car and notice it's very hot, especially one that's recently been driven. This car looks like it's been there longer because those caps or wheels are black where this one looks like it's recently been parked because you can easily see the hot white underneath. Notice the truck driver here. See how he's appearing as white? That's because he's got a lot of body heat. By the way, these FLIR cameras are the ones that police use 
to locate suspects that are running from the cops. This footage was taken from 50 yards away at nighttime with the handheld FLIR. You can easily see these two people making an exchange from the front door of her house. I wanted this to burn in your mind how easily you can be seen with forward-looking infrared radar. I wanted you to see how sensitive FLIR cameras are. She places her hand on the car, and when she removes her hand, you will notice that FLIR detected heat left over from her hand. Now that will slowly begin to fade as it recools. Watch this transformer and telephone pole as we focus in with the FLIR. Look how hot that transformer is. A lot of electricity going through there. Look how hot the lines are. That's from the flow of electricity. Dogs expel heat out of their mouth, whether you knew that or not. They can't sweat. That's why they pant. Look how hot the mouth is. This is what a neighborhood looks like when holding a FLIR camera while driving down the road. And this is footage of the helicopter flying over a neighborhood. This gives you an idea of what FLIR looks like from the air. Now this is footage taken of a place of business and a house. Of course they wouldn't be able to see you pumping heat out from this height, but they'll get closer and the FLIR cameras on helicopters have an amazing ability to zoom in. You're going to see this from afar off and then you'll see it flip. Now that's a close-up shot of what you were seeing a bit ago. You'll see him flip back and forth. This is the close-up view. And the far away view. So keep that in mind. If you hear a helicopter from far off, if he has a clear line of sight, he can see you. And you can see if somebody was pumping heat out of this building right here, it could be seen by the FLIR. They basically look for two things. One portion of the house that's glowing or showing excessive heat, or they look for heat being pumped out of your grow room. And coming up is what everybody wants to see and that's an actual grow room under FLIR. Let's see if you can spot it before I point it out. Do you see it? That is heat being pumped out of a house. This spot right here, this is a basketball goal that you're seeing. This is an overhang from a porch connected to this house. The porch light's right here emitting the heat. This is not a light. That is heat being pumped out of the house from a grow room. That's what police look for. If your grow room is large enough that you must pump heat out of your house, it's much safer to pump it into the floor and under the house if you have a pier and beam. This is impossible to do with a concrete slab, so pick a house that's pier and beam and run the vents under the house. This causes the heat to spread out and it cannot be detected by FLIR. If you're using the really hot, hot lights like the mercury halide or the high pressure sodium, you can actually have 1,000 watt light in a room and that heat will spread throughout the entire house and FLIR cannot pick it up. The idea is to spread the heat throughout your house much like a heater does in the wintertime. FLIR cannot detect that. It's the concentration of heat that FLIR detects. If you have a small grow box in your house or you're growing in a closet, the heat generated from the lights can easily be vented into the rest of the house, again, avoiding FLIR detection. Another great idea if you must pump heat out of your house is to pump the heat 
through your clothes dryer vent. Then if blur cameras get around your house, it simply looks like you're drying a load of clothes. Another guaranteed method you can use to ensure the footage of a FLIR camera doesn't show up on a search warrant affidavit is to grow using fluorescent lights and LED lights. I know there's a lot of controversy surrounding the quality of the bud when a grower uses fluorescence, but I've interviewed at least 50 growers and at least half of them tell me you can grow a good quality bud using a high-powered fluorescent lights referred to as the T5s. Fluorescent lights use very little electricity and they generate almost zero heat. So using these type of lights ensures no heat, therefore no FLIR imaging. The LED lights, light emitting diodes, are new on the grow scene. As far as how well they help plants grow, it's up for controversy, but I do know this. They generate very little power and zero heat like the fluorescence. So if you find out they do work, I highly recommend a combination of the fluorescence and the LEDs. You have to weigh the cost of gel versus the perception of a lesser quality bud. There's another disadvantage to using the lights that create a lot of heat. For one, they create suspiciously high electric bills, and that heat often causes fires. So if you're using these type of lights, keep it in check, make sure you've got everything tight, or you could come home to a burned down grow room. The second enemy to your grow room operation is people. People under pressure by the police will do crazy things, including tell on you to get you busted. I know you're proud of that garden. I know you worked hard on that garden. The fewer people that know about your grow room, the safer you are. In fact, you can count on your hands that every person that knows about your grow room increases your chances of getting busted by 10%. If 10 people know about your grow room, there's a 100% chance you're going to get busted. So keep it secret. Did you know that electric company employees are paid money by the police to report high electricity bills? I heard of one case that electric company employees are getting paid $1,000 per report. That's very enticing to an electric company employee that might not be making that much money. So you have to keep your electric bills down so that person doesn't become the enemy of your grow room. Some growers choose to steal electricity by routing the electricity around their meter. Don't do that, that's stealing. There are too many other ways to grow pot safely without having to steal electricity. The third enemy of your grow room operation is sloppiness. Most people just simply do not have the information needed to help them control the evidence that the police can use against them. Growers constantly make sloppy mistakes when trying to get the grow equipment into their house. There is a safe way to get everything you need to grow marijuana to your door without getting busted. Absolutely never ever use your own computer to order any grow equipment, fertilizers, lights, anything like that. Each computer has an IP address, which is the same as every home has an address, so does every computer and that could be traced. If you're going to use a computer to order your equipment online, choose a public computer such as one in a public library or an internet chat room. When paying for your grow equipment online, be sure and use a gift credit card. You can purchase these at Walmart or the mall. These credit cards are impossible to trace back to you because you don't have to give a name to purchase one. After purchasing your equipment on a public computer with a gift credit card, you must have the equipment shipped to a safe address 
that can't be traced to you. Some people advise obtaining a fake ID and then renting a post office box and getting that equipment sent there. I do not recommend that. That's a felony. That's breaking another law. You can safely get your equipment into your home without having to break any laws. Simply pick a shipping address of a friend or a relative and explain to them you have a gift for your wife or a significant other being shipped to them. You didn't want it shipped to your house or your wife or significant other would figure out uh, the surprise. This guarantees that grow equipment will go somewhere that can't be traced. My favorite way to purchase grow equipment is to buy it directly from a store with cash. It's a good idea to make sure and borrow somebody else's car when you drive to a grow store. Don't take your own car. You're not jeopardizing the person that you borrow the car from because there will be no grow operation set up at their house. You will be in jeopardy if you use your own vehicle. When you're traveling to the grow store to make the purchase, you want to make certain you're not being followed. It's almost impossible to tell somebody unless the police are using three or four vehicles in unison where the first vehicle can begin following, turn off, the second vehicle picks them up, they turn off, the third vehicle picks them up, giving the other two a chance to catch up, and they continue seesawing in that fashion where it looks less suspicious. If police are using that method to follow you, you'll never know it, but it's very easy to screw them up by doing fast stops, turning around or even acting like you're gonna turn around and then continue straight. It's all about misdirection or simply pull over. Let vehicles pass for a bit. Go back in the opposite direction and see what's coming back at you. Look at these cars. Now, if any of those vehicles start hitting their brake lights or turning off, it's a good chance they were following you and you tripped them up and caused them to tap their brake. And like I said, you might not see those four or five vehicles working in unison to follow you, but I promise you, they go crazy on the radio. He's turning this way, he turned that way, and before long, you've lost them. It's not hard to shake people following you. Make certain you use these methods going to and from the grow shop. When you approach a grow shop store, you want to perform what's called a heat run and make certain that spot's not being watched. A heat run consists of zooming around a parking lot and being totally aware of your surroundings. The first thing I noticed when I came into this parking lot was this suspiciously parked truck now see how he's facing away from the store? The store is behind the truck. Cops don't point towards stores to watch them. They're trained to park away and they look at it through their rear view mirror. And what's even more suspicious is this male in the passenger seat is looking through his rear view mirror with his rear view mirror cocked. Now that could be legitimate, he could be waiting for somebody to come out, but it doesn't look like it. Of course, look for the, the signature van with blacked out windows or Suburbans with blacked out windows. Police use those to set up surveillance. Any conversation about any illegal substance voids all sales. When you purchase your grow equipment, and you get ready to drive home with it, leave in the opposite direction of the grow location. Take the grow equipment somewhere else, let it cool off for about a week or so, then go back, retrieve your items, and take them to the grow location. Another sloppy mistake that growers make is failing to control the odor of the marijuana. Anybody that's ever been close to a marijuana plant can tell you it has a distinct and strong odor. 
the only safe way that really, really works is pumping the air from your grow room through a carbon filter. This air can be pumped into your house, do not pump it outside, and that totally takes care of the odor problem. I understand that if you have a million dollar grow operation, it takes a lot of filters and a lot more work. Controlling trash should enter your mind as controlling evidence. Police look through trash cans to try and gather evidence that proves you're growing marijuana in your house. Do not throw anything in the trash that can be linked to a grow operation. You must take this type of trash to a nearby dumpster somewhere and get it off your property. Fertilizer sacks, grow equipment boxes, data that you recorded. Get that stuff and keep that stuff out of your house and absolutely never put it in your trash can. Larger operations have a problem with the excess stems and leaves after they harvest the bud off the marijuana plants. It's my recommendation that the leftover marijuana stems and leaves must be taken off your property. Now you're running a great risk by placing it in your car and getting it to a place it can be dumped. But watch Traffic Stops Volume 1 and learn how to safely drive your stash in a vehicle. If you live in a rural area, it's an even better idea to hand carry these extra stems and leaves through the woods a mile away from your property. Get it off your property however you must in a safe fashion. Now I know if you're growing marijuana, you're a cannabis proponent and you're excited about your work. But do not display nor possess any paraphernalia such as marijuana leaf t-shirts or emblems, anything relating to marijuana must be taken out of your house never to return again. Keep that place clean. Now I understand another huge part of not getting busted for growing marijuana indoors is being able to sell that marijuana safely. We cover that in this DVD in the how to sell marijuana section. So use those tips to help get rid of your stash. One of law enforcement's favorite tools used to invade your home is called a knock and talk or a tap and wrap. Knock and talks and tap and wraps lean on the idea that it is not illegal for the police to knock on your door and discuss you possibly being involved in criminal activity. In other words, it is not illegal for the police to knock on your door and ask you if you're growing or are in possession of marijuana. When I heard the knock on the door, I uh, glanced out the window and I saw that there was a some men outside. I didn't really see get a good picture of their uh, of their badges or anything, but I did see that there were men outside. Um, when I had my son in my arms and he was crying, and I know he's making noise, so I figured I had to open the door. Knock and talks are usually triggered by an anonymous tip, a tip from somebody seeking revenge, suspicious traffic coming in and out of your house, or some other reasonable suspicion. Police cannot obtain a search warrant without probable cause. So when they only have reasonable suspicions, they show up at your door to do a knock and talk to manipulate their way into your home. Well, when I first opened the door, uh, they said that uh, they needed to talk to me. And uh, when I told them that they needed to get a warrant, they uh, started to show their guns and a couple of them seemed to be taking them out and uh, at that point um, they first just asked if they could come in then they won't and when I said no they uh, they said they smelled marijuana which I knew that wasn't true because I got um, rosemary and uh, 
in sage right outside my door. There's no way they could smell anything. When I was trying to keep the door, like to barely talk to them, they um, one of them breached the door, made sure that uh, that I couldn't close it or do anything, and pretty much uh, they forced me to go ahead and let them in. Uh, they, and when once they got in, I mean. I have made dozens of arrests, including a 230-pound marijuana seizure using the knock-and-talk technique. Never get busted constantly gets emails from citizens complaining of going to jail behind a knock-and-talk or a tap-and-wrap. This method of arresting citizens for marijuana is being used more and more every day by law enforcement. All the people I arrested and all the people emailing me for help made one critical error. They all opened the door for the police. A lot of well-meaning drug reformers and attorneys have instructed citizens to open the door step out on the porch and shut the door behind them when confronted with a knock and talk. When I was a narcotics officer, if I could get the person to open the door, I knew I could search their house. I would explain I smelled marijuana, that if they forced me to go get a search warrant, I was going to arrest everybody in the house and seize their home and put them in prison, or they could simply cooperate, sign a consent to search form, and allow me to search. It worked every time. Had they not opened the door for me, I never would have been able to manipulate them into signing a consent to search their home. Tell me about when they uh, wanted you to sign the consent to search form. <laughs> See, they came in and said they smelled marijuana, so I, I had always thought that when they say that, that they that meant they could go ahead and search my house. Well, these cops um, sat down with me and uh, asked me to sign a consent to search. And I said no, uh, was my first answer right away. I told them no. Well, they didn't really like that, and, they, and the, the nice cops still were trying to talk me into to letting them see my plants or whatever. They started off with little things like, uh, well, if we, if we have to get a, a search warrant, it's just gonna make things harder on you. And um, I still wasn't saying anything. They still kept pressing a little bit, and that's when they started. That's when they said, you know, um, if if we have to, if we get a search warrant, your wife's going to go to jail, your child's going to be taken away, and uh, and you're going to be charged and taken to jail too. So you can either work with us, and most likely, if you really do just have 10, 20, 30 plants, we'll just, we'll let you go. We're going to get out of your hair. Uh, we'll take we'll take the plants. We'll be out of here. And. Uh, after they were threatening me with that, I couldn't stand the thought of my wife going to jail or losing my baby. So I uh, told, the, told them everything that I had, that w it was all mine, and uh, that I assumed the full responsibility for it. Remember, cops do not get into any type of trouble if they lose a case in court. If they coerce their way into your house and violate the Fourth Amendment and lose the case, it's no big deal to them. They're not disciplined in any way. A drug seizure is a drug seizure in the eyes of the police, whether it's successfully prosecuted or not. They tried to act like they were my friends for the most part. They said that, um, that I needed to talk to them and uh, that they knew there was marijuana in my house. So I told them, well, yeah, I, that I did have a little bit. I just wanted to be honest with them. I had already messed up by letting them in. So I was just going to be honest with them. Uh, they told me, uh, there were three of them, three or four, um, and two of them were pretending to be like my friends. And they were telling me, oh, just show, if you have just a little bit of bud, then we'll, we'll let you go and uh, you can get on with the, it's not going to be a big deal. We're looking for people who are growing hundreds, uh, hundred, at, at least 100 plants. So I went thinking, I didn't think it was a big deal. So I showed them the little jar I had the, the bud that I used used and um, they t after that he looked at it he looked at me and he asked me to show him where my plants were and once again told me that he that they knew I had between 100 and 150 or even more plants in my house 
And that if I didn't, if I had a lower amount, uh, if I had 10, 20, 30, even 40 or 50, that they weren't looking for people like that. They were looking for big people that were doing big, that were grow, had big grow operations. And uh, they're doing anything in their power to make me feel like, uh, like they were my friends, which, and lie to me um, about it. just How so they How many plants did you have? Uh, they counted 22, counting like, uh, I think I had a, about two or three that were, weren't even rooted. They were just little cuttings, but they still counted them as plants. The best and the only way to win in a knock and talk situation is to never, ever, ever open your door for the police. Just as you're under no obligation to allow any citizen into your home, you're under no obligation to open the door for the cops. If the police had a legal right to be in your home, they wouldn't be knocking, they would be kicking. They would kick the door in and raid your house with a search warrant. The mere fact that they're knocking on your door tells you they don't have a right to be in your home, so don't open the door for them. If you hear a knock at your door and upon investigating, you notice it's the police. If your door is not locked, go ahead and lock it right then. I don't open the door for police. If you need to talk to me, have your dispatcher call my cell phone, or we can yell through the window like this. If you have a search warrant, here are my hands. Kick the door in. And did they let you go like they said? Of course not. As soon as uh, I, throughout the whole thing, uh, I had two of the cops talking to me, acting like they were my friends, reading my High Times magazines commenting on how the buds looked, stuff like that, um, playing with my kids' toys. Um, I didn't know until they were carrying my crap out, even after that, that I, uh, I was going to jail. And because the other guys were telling me, oh, it's, you're probably not going to go to jail. As soon as they had done everything, they got everything out of my house, they uh, told me to put my hands behind my back and uh, they were going to arrest me. I asked them if there was any way that I could just walk out to the truck so my neighbors wouldn't see me, see all this. And uh, they said, sorry, no. And, uh, they handcuffed me and proceeded to carry me out by my, by, by the handcuffs, just like, yeah, just like I would hurt somebody or something. If all of America would use this one piece of advice to never open your door for a police officer, it would totally neutralize the cops in regards to knock and talks and tap and raps. If you do not open the door, you will not go to jail. Never open the door for the cops and never get busted. Welcome back to my kitchen. If you don't follow all the advice on this video, you take a chance of getting raided. If you do get raided, you'll want to make sure your home is canine proof. What I mean by that is we want to contaminate the entire house, indoors and outdoors, with the odor of marijuana. In case a police dog is brought to the scene, it will so confuse the dog, they'll have to put the dog back in the car, leaving humans to try and find your well-hidden stash. A great way to start canine proofing your home is to take all your seeds and stems that you would normally flush down the toilet, place it in a coffee grinder, hit the button. You want to grind the seeds up because we're going to throw them into the yard at a moment and you don't want any little plants popping up. By scattering the ground up seeds and stems throughout your yard, it creates an odor barrier around your house. So when a canine walks through that, he'll be scratching everywhere and it drives the, the handler nuts. If you remember what I taught in the Traffic Stops Volume 1 DVD, I explained that microscopic dust gets transferred everywhere when handling marijuana. We can use that to our advantage. An excellent way to canine proof the inside of your home 
is to take a bag of marijuana and just rub it everywhere and transfer that microscopic dust, causing the dog to alert everywhere you rubbed. How did you survive as long as you did moving the weight you moved and only get clipped once and that was because of a phone tap? Being on the streets, selling drugs, there's a lot of wisdom and knowledge that's kind of passed down. I um, was very, very good at detecting this portion of the DVD is probably the most controversial section because I teach you how to spot undercover officers and informants. We've been led to believe our entire lives through the media and our government that police officers are dying daily in this war on drugs. The truth is According to the FBI, only 28 police officers have lost their lives in the war on drugs between 1996 and 2005. That's only 2.8 police officers per year. Compare that to the millions of American citizens who have either lost their lives or who are in prison facing being raped or stabbed because of a nonviolent drug crime. And who ever said the life of a cop was worth more than the life of a citizen? In fact, it's supposed to be the other way around. Cops are supposed to lay down their lives for American citizens. So remember, anytime you hear something in the media that you've learned is not the truth, it's called propaganda and it's used to manipulate your belief systems. I highly recommend a diet of true journalism and that's the internet. Always make sure to compare what you've heard on TV to the great information that can be found on the internet. If you're a police officer and the information I'm about to share bothers you or makes you feel unsafe, then stop being an undercover officer and channel your law enforcement energy to chasing violent offenders. Okay, let's discuss how to spot these secret government agents. There are numerous ways to spot undercover cops. The most important way is to remember that undercover police officers are trained liars. As an eight-year veteran in law enforcement, I told more lies than I have my entire life. I was a trained liar. We can use this information to our advantage by making sure to pay close attention to suspected person's body language. Remember what I taught in Traffic Stops Volume 1? The two top indicators of deception according to the FBI polygraph manual or any hand-to-head -head contact, which includes grooming, and palms up. Stay away from people that are exhibiting these signs of deception. Unfortunately, juries tend to believe police officers, and that's sad, because like I mentioned before, we were all trained to lie. Police can legally lie to you to get you put behind bars. The two top lies that undercover police officers use as an excuse to purchase narcotics are, I'm buying it for my girlfriend or boyfriend, and number two, I'm buying it to resell. So if you hear any of these two excuses, beware. They were the two I used over and over and over again. So if a person wants to buy a small amount of marijuana from you, and they give you the excuse it's for resale, be suspicious. Another great tip to remember is police are always operating on their own clock, meaning if they want to meet you at 3 p.m., they freak if you don't meet them at 3 p.m. So if you're trying to do business with somebody that's not on pot time, beware. My favorite tip in discovering an undercover police officer 
is understanding the principle that police are absolutely forbidden to allow seized drugs to re-enter the marketplace, meaning cops buy drugs all the time. They very seldom sell drugs. And if they are going to sell drugs, they must make the arrest shortly after the transaction has taken place to keep those drugs from re-entering society. This is valuable information because if you suspect somebody's an undercover officer and you're not sure, ask them to bring you a joint and walk away with that joint. And if they allow that to happen, you can be pretty positive they're not an undercover cop. This helps us become comfortable when we're out of town trying to score our medicine. It's safe to go into a neighborhood and try to get a quarter bag of marijuana and not be worried, is that a cop selling me that marijuana? The only time this might happen is when the police are using a tactic called a road kill. They sell you a quarter bag of marijuana, you drive away, they pull you over on a traffic stop. That's easy to beat if you watch Traffic Stops Volume 1. As soon as you get the quarter bag of marijuana, get it ready to eat as you drive away. If the cops start pulling you over, simply eat it and you'll be okay. The only other time the police will be involved in selling you drugs is when they're trying to sell a large amount to lure in large amounts of money. That's called a reversal operation. I personally have been involved in dozens of reversal operations. And let me tell you, the number one thing we must do is to make sure when we hand the suspect the kilo of cocaine or the pound of marijuana and we get the money, not to let anything happen to those drugs to re-enter society. So if you're involved in one of these, they're going to wipe you out right then. Always be suspicious of large transactions. If you are going to be involved in a marijuana transaction, another way to root out the moles, change locations constantly. Police spend a great amount of time prior to a transaction setting up surveillance, rigging cameras, rigging body wires, so if you decide to have a last minute change and you want to do the transaction across the street in another parking lot and they're not willing to do that, you're probably dealing with the police. Never go to another person's hotel room to make a transaction. Always make them come to your room and never reveal that place until the last minute. Once the transaction is made, leave the hotel. By operating in this method, you know for sure you're not walking into a trap of hidden cameras and body wires. Speaking of making location changes, change your phones constantly. Never talk on anything but a prepaid cell phone that can be purchased at Walmart or some other place like that. After you've talked that transaction through, throw that phone away and get another one. That will keep you safe from wiretaps. I would buy a prepaid phone from Walmart and talk on that briefly and once the deal is made, throw that phone away and get another one. Change your number constantly and that's what kept me moving. I changed number, locations, everything. I think this is an important time to dispel two of the biggest myths when it comes to undercover officers. Myth number one, police must tell you they're an undercover officer when asked. Lie, 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 that is absolutely not the truth. Police are under no obligation to tell you they're a cop. Now my guess is that rumor started with the entrapment defense that we used to use years ago. The entrapment defense is not being recognized in courts anymore like it used to be. Again, cops not only can lie, but they will lie. The second myth I would like to dispel is the myth that says undercover cops use drugs. That's not true in 2008. 
a long time ago, and in Hollywood on TV, all the undercover cops used drugs. Police officers are strictly forbidden to partake of any illegal substances, period. Now that's not to say there will be that one renegade cop that goes overboard and uses. So please understand this tip as a guideline and it's not 100% proof positive. But you do know if you're in front of somebody that will not partake, you're probably dealing with an undercover. What cops are trained to do and what they're good at is to simulate drug use. Their favorite method to use is to pretend to be smoking marijuana and they're simply passing the smoke from their mouth through their nose. To counter this, insist that the person you suspect take a big bong hit. It's impossible to simulate that. And I'm Mark Emery of Cannabis Culture Magazine here with my good friend and former Texas lawman, Barry Cooper. Say hi to everyone. Else. Hello, everybody. And take a rip of the Prince of Pods bong just to make sure everybody knows he's still, he's not a cop these days. They're not allowed to do that if they're real Texas <laughs> And finally, remember, police officers are constantly scanning for evidence. They're logging down license plates. They're trying to take things from your home to put in the evidence room. One of their favorite things to steal for evidence is one of your marijuana roaches. So if you're smoking with four or five people, keep an eye on who's taking that roach. It could wind up in an evidence room. This section will teach you how to spot informants. They're a little trickier to spot than undercover police officers because these people usually come in the form of a friend. Informants are people that are working very closely with the police to get you busted. The motive behind an informant is either money, they're getting paid to put you in jail, or they've been promised that their sentence will be reduced or completely dropped if they put you in jail. One of the officers took me back into the, the bedroom and asked if he could talk to me and he said, I'm going to tell you how to make this go away. And I kind of had a suspicion that he was going to talk about, you know, informing on someone else and he, that's what he did talk about. He said that he didn't think Ryan seemed very receptive to this idea, but he wanted to talk to me about it and see if maybe I could influence him that um, you know this kind of thing happens every day and every day people turn around and inform on someone else to get out of trouble. He told me that all we would have to do was um, I think he said two different people we would have to make purchase purchase from two different people and he said that the way it would work is that we would make a purchase and then they would even let another deal take place so that the dealer wouldn't know it was us and then they would go in and take them down and then that then our charges would just be dropped and everything would go away. And he told me that they had, he had, um, he knew people that were addicted to cocaine and addicted to speed that ended up in jail every couple of weeks. And he would get calls from them saying, okay, I'm in jail, I need to get out, I'll tell you about somebody else. So he said that it was really common. He, he promised that nobody would ever find out. So I just said, you know, that doesn't really sound like something that, you know, that we want to do. So I'm going to say no, and I think that my husband's going to say no too. And of course, that's nothing we would ever do. So let's learn how to spot these terrified and manipulated citizens who are in the jam of their life. During my eight years of law enforcement, I arrested over 800 people for drug offenses. I was able to turn 95% of those drug offenders into informants. Do not forget that. I was able to do this through lies, fear, intimidation, and manipulation. If I caught a person with drugs, I threatened to place them in prison, seize their home, separate them from their loved ones, take their kids to department services, call their boss where they would lose their job, and if that didn't work, there were times I threatened to plant drugs on them if they didn't inform. Now, I never planted drugs in my entire law enforcement career, but I certainly made people believe that I would do that if they didn't work for me. So remember, informants are very terrified and scared and manipulated people, but they're not trained liars. 
through questioning over and over, it's easy to catch them in a lie. Remember that. If it's not already obvious to you, stay away from people that just got busted or have disappeared for a while and then all of a sudden come back into your life and want to know your business. I don't care if it's your brother or your sister or your best friend. If they've recently been in trouble with the law, absolutely do nothing illegal in front of them. Don't be afraid to bring up the subject of informants in front of somebody you suspect. Bring the subject up and then watch for the body language. Remember, police are always on their own clock. During a drug operation, they're always the one in charge. So if you're dealing with somebody that constantly has to get an okay from their partner, they're probably partnered with the police. And remember, a big job of an informant is to introduce you to an undercover operative. So always be suspicious of new faces. Just like vice cops, informants are often wired with hidden cameras or audio recording devices. These cleverly designed devices come in the form of pins, hats, belt buckles. They can be anything, so they're impossible to detect. They're not impossible to counter if you insist on discussing your activities in a swimming pool or a sauna. The water cancels out all that technology. If you find it difficult to get into water to discuss a transaction, you can always whisper any incriminating evidence in their ear. This assures nothing's recorded. And unlike drug cops, informants will use drugs and they will put drugs on the street. They usually sign a long form agreeing not to do anything illegal, but I've seen very few that hold to that rule. And finally, the tip that I hold dear to my heart. It's not paranoia if it's really happening. So be paranoid because it's happening. The undercovers are out there and the informants are out there trying to place you in prison. We live in a nation that guarantees against cruel and unusual punishment. We here in the Middle East, if you steal something, your hand gets cut off. We think that's cruel and unusual. Go into our prisons and ask these drug offenders that have been sentenced to 99 years and give them the option. We cut your hand off or you stay here for 99 years and every one of them will gladly get their hand cut off. I understand why a mother would inform to the police to keep their own child out of prison. And that's what's sad about this drug war We've turned our nation into a nation of dishonorable people. I would like to see us rebuild in the communities the characters of honor, loyalty, and respect. And until we end this drug war, people, that's not going to happen. Here is another controversial topic. I'm going to share with you how to sell marijuana to another party and never get raided. The number one tool law enforcement uses to raid your home is to get an informant to go to your house and make a purchase. The informant then takes the contraband to the police officer. That police officer draws up a search warrant and within 72 hours, you get raided. Never ever sell marijuana from your house. There is a safe way to sell marijuana, and I'm going to show you how. In all my years in law enforcement, I've never heard of anybody being busted using this method. The only way you can really get caught using this technique is if you're dealing with an undercover officer or an informant. And even then, they can't raid your home because your house wasn't involved. First, place your stash in a black trash bag. Then take your stash away from your home to an isolated area. Hide your stash where you can easily find it later, but secure enough where animals won't drag it away and strangers do not discover it. Communicate with the buyer. Try using code words if you're using a telephone without sounding too much like you're talking in code. 
return to your hidden stash, making sure nobody followed you and nobody's nearby. Take only what was ordered. Make certain to wipe your fingerprints off the large bag before re-securing. As you drive off looking for a notable landmark, be certain to wipe your fingerprints off the smaller bag of contraband. Make the drop and drive away to meet your customer. Upon meeting the customer, say, hey, thanks for paying me back that money I loaned you. Take the money and whisper in his ear where the drop point location is. It is also important for the customer to be safe during this transaction. So follow along as I teach how to retrieve the stash. When arriving at the drop point, walk straight to the stash and pretend to pick it up. Return to your auto and drive away. If the cops are involved in this deal and are waiting for you to arrive, they will bust you within minutes of leaving. Of course, they will have no evidence because you left the true contraband at the drop point. If you did not get busted driving away, it is then safe to return and recover your purchase. Make certain to watch Traffic Stops Volume 1 to learn how to drive your stash safely. When I was a police officer, SWAT teams were very rare. Now it seems every town has a little SWAT team. During the shooting of this film, we learned that three days ago, in a small town in Ohio, a SWAT team raided a 25-year-old mother with six children. They used flash grenades and machine guns, shooting and killing the 25-year-old mother, shooting the one-year-old baby in her arms. The one-year-old baby had to have a finger amputated, and they're not sure what's going to happen to the arm. Does America need another drug case that bad? that they have to shoot and kill a 25-year-old mother and a one-year-old baby? And what's even crazier is there is a non-violent way to conduct search warrants. Many cops have heard about the West Texas Sheriff that used to conduct raids in a non manner. You remember how if he had a search warrant for a person's home, he simply did surveillance on the house until the residents drove away? and he pulled them over on a traffic stop, arrested them, got the keys to the house, interviewed the suspect, ultimately resulting in placing a key in a door and opening the house and calling the other people forward to arrest them without any shots being fired, without any flash grenades, without any of that stuff. Listen, I know what the police are doing. You're breaking into these homes in this manner, not because you have to, but because you have this huge adrenaline rush and you think it's cool. It's not cool terrorizing our American families. So please, until we get this drug war repealed, change your way of breaking into our homes so we don't have to go to the funerals of 25-year-old mothers and we don't handicap a one-year-old baby the rest of his life. Barry and I have four wonderful kids who are straight-A students and popular wherever they go. The reason for this is because we teach our kids the truth about everything, including drugs. Candy's exactly right. Parents, stop trusting government programs such as D.A.R.E. to teach your kids the truth about drugs. They're not teaching the truth. They're teaching lies. Did you know in 5,000 years of recorded use, not one person has ever overdosed on marijuana?
You know, it's sad our kids have to share books in our public school systems and struggle to get money to go to college, yet we spend $17 million a day housing our nonviolent drug offenders. We built 21 prisons in the state of California last year and only one university. Parents, something is backwards. I want you to think about something. When was the last time you heard of a kid dying from an illegal drug in your neighborhood? It's very, very rare. It's not the drugs that are killing our kids, it's prohibition. Do you realize we have 1.5 million children without one or both parents because of the drug war? That's right, their parents are setting out a nonviolent drug crime. Now what causes more harm, the drug or the kids not being with their parents? And finally, we must be honest about our parenting skills. We've all made mistakes. There is absolutely no evidence that says when a kid uses drugs, it causes them to go burglarize or commit another crime. The truth is selfishness and dishonor and disrespect are causing those things. It's easy for parents and teachers and doctors to blame our children's bad behavior on the drugs. The truth is it's bad parenting. We already have laws in place in this country to protect me and you and our kids. If a person commits a crime of violence, there's a law in place to put them in jail for that. We live in America, parents, and if people want to use drugs till their teeth fall out of their head and, and develop this horrible quality of life because they wouldn't stop, they have the right to be miserable. Now, if they get up out of that drug-induced state and go and commit a crime, put them in jail for that crime, but not the drug. He's right, parents. Teach your kids the truth about drugs. Love, Love peace, peace, and, and never, never get, get busted. busted. There's a former yeah. cop put up a website that tells drug dealers and drug smugglers how to get away with their crimes, correct? Right. He's a former cop who is against the war on drugs, thinks it's a bad idea. But, I mean, it's just vile. I mean, these people are just yeah. vile. It gets worse and worse. And sometimes body wires come in the form of a book. This one's 30% off, by the way. Okay, you're seeing candy at the marijuana plants we showed you all ago, and here I am. That's 10 yards. That's what it takes to get a first down in football. He's right. So parents, teach your kids the truth about drugs. Love, peace, and, and never, never get, get busted. busted. <laughs> I think we should do love, peace, and never get busted all together. He's right. So parents, teach your kids the truth about drugs. Love, love peace. peace. And then, no, it's okay for me to look at you. I'll I know, but you're going to love peace. Do, do it like this. Love, peace, and never get busted. Try it. Love, love peace. No. What? Love. Do it, follow me. Oh, okay. Love, love peace, peace, and, and never, never get busted. busted. right parents teach your kids the truth about drugs love, love and peace we'll go love, love. Peace, <laughs> just go let's practice a one-time texas drug agent is now showing drug dealers and users how to conceal their stash to avoid getting busted that's barry cooper a one-time texas drug agent described by his former boss as one of the best narcotics officers in the country uh you know i think a lot of folks are sort of shaking their heads why? why? Why go from being a great narcotics officer to doing this? Uh, maturity, logic, reason, and uh, compassion would tell any uh, logical, reasonable, and 
compassionate adult that it is unreasonable to, for 10 men to break into a house with semi-automatic weapons and raid gear and drag mommy and daddy to jail orphaning the kids. Well, it is against the law. It, it was made against the law in 1937 when Harry Anslinger testified before the Senate that marijuana needed to be made illegal because of its effects on the degenerate races. And I'll quote him when he said before the Senate that uh, marijuana causes white women to seek relations with Negroes. And marijuana has been illegal ever since. And the debate is over. It's much safer than alcohol. And the harm we're causing on American citizens by placing them in prison and jail where they can be murdered, stabbed, or raped for such a harmless plant right. is a greater harm we're causing than if we would have just allowed them to smoke the pot. The hero's already riled up about this next <laughs> guest. Uh, you have to imagine a cop who advises dopers how to hide their stash. That's exactly what former narcotics police officer Barry Cooper uh, is doing. He's produced a DVD called Never Get Busted Again. And uh, uh, officer, former officer Cooper joins me now from, from Dallas. So uh, first, first of all, is it selling? Let me just ask you the commercial question, Barry. Oh, yes, sir. We've sold over 10,000 copies worldwide in the last six months with over... 18 million hits on our website nevergetbusted.com and and why and, and this is the obviously this is the the 64 dollar question here why does a cop advising criminals how to beat the law are you a renegade uh, oh absolutely a not, traitor not to a your old profession no 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 i'm an american citizen and i used logic reason and the real facts about the safety of marijuana and then i mixed compassion in with that and i realized that uh, 10 of my comrades crashing into a house at 3 in the morning after we threw flash grenades in the window to uh, take mommy and daddy to jail for marijuana is much more uh, okay, well, hold side it effects hold it. than the marijuana itself. Okay, okay I, I, I can dig that. But what if it's crack cocaine? What if it's heroin? What if it's uh, hey, you, crystal meth? It's the same you know hiding what? technique, isn't it? Okay, yeah, but listen, uh, prohibition never changes the demand. It only changes the supplier. We took alcohol out of the hands of Coors and put it into the hands of Al Capone. Uh, there was a lot of people that would much rather be going to Marlboro to get their marijuana and even other drugs, uh, but okay, uh, we've okay. taken I, it out of the hands of them. Okay, got the, got the argument. Sorry. DVD, never get busted again, Judge. Barry, let me ask you a question. How long were you a cop? I was a cop for eight years. Okay, and you had, as I understand it, 500 arrests during the course of those eight years? 500, 500 drug arrests? Arrest. Yes, yes. I, bought kilos of, I bought kilos of cocaine undercover. Okay. I, I ran over 100 search warrants. All right. My understanding, yeah. the way I figure it, is 300 felony arrests, 500 misdemeanor arrests. You had five, month, five a month misdemeanors, three a month felonies. Do you think that that's a significant experience that gives you the experience and the ability to make a commentary on the whole legal system that cops wouldn't die if we legalize drugs? I mean, absolutely five cases a month, and you think that you're going to change the system? Absolutely, it gives me that because I'm an American citizen, and I am experienced more than other narcotics officers. And what I've makes you joint operations? Well, look, look, five hundred thousand dollars in assets in eight years is nothing. There are cops okay. in New York City yeah, who do that okay, every okay. day. You know what? And as an American this citizen, was, this, aren't you aware this, that you can change the laws? Why don't you just try changing the laws as opposed to actually trying to help the sellers of drugs? Tell me that. We've tr we've tried for thirty years to end the war on drugs, and the politicians are not. Well, you know what, sir? You know what? It's just because take true, it's going to take true activism. And this is and activism. It's going to take this is activism. You it's trying going to, to take reason. You trying to help logic. drug dealers? Oh, yeah, a defense attorney. Give me a defense attorney. Mark Garagos. Mark Garagos. Help us out. If you're going to interrupt, I'm going to interrupt. Okay. Let me let me have Mark uh, Mark weigh in. <laughs> but let me let me just weigh in for a second. Go ahead. The guys the the guy's not doing anything that I can see that's illegal. He wants to make a statement. The, I, I'll tell you, this war on drugs is a complete failure. The criminal justice system is completely overloaded because of this idiotic policy that we have. And he's absolutely correct. Mark, but you're never going to get anywhere. You're never going to get anywhere. Are you with this saying that we effort. should legalize cocaine, crack, yeah, heroin? Absolutely. What about absolutely. the drug absolutely. cartels? What about legalize. the organized criminal you enterprises should, that have greater gun power legalize. than the police departments? You Are you kidding, the, Mark? Mr. Right. Smith, no, no, right. you want to hold on for a second, Janine? No. No, no, no. Why am I not doing it? Problem by helping you sell it. Tax it, tax it, and then build you bridges. Don't the if you think this is good, it. Marilyn Monroe is reincarnated after this. <laughs>
What's up? I'm Bo Deacons. Hi, I'm Roy Hill. We hope you guys enjoyed the soundtrack we provided for the DVD. And remember, if you follow Barry's guidelines specifically, you will never, ever get busted. And you'll never get raided. Peace out. Peace. Most talk radio sucks. What if you found a show that wanted to end the war on drugs? Would you listen? Join us for the number one pro-liberty talk show, Free Talk Live. Listen live or via podcast for free at freetalklive.com.